I'm Dr. Joseph Fetto, Associate Professor of Orthopedics at the New York University Medical Center, Hospital for Joint Diseases. I am the inventor of the lateral flare revelation stem, and this is an explanation of the background, the history, and the actual product. The revelation hip stem represents a new step in orthopedics where we're now trying to bring technologies that are available to the study of orthopedic surgery. Previously, we had done this in much more of a trial and examination mode of learning in terms of design and development of hip concepts. What we're doing now is we're bringing new technologies, computer science, graphics, 3D analysis, to the process of design and development to come up with more realistic models. The history of, of hip biomechanics can be brought back to the 19th century roots where there were two schools competing. There was Julius Wolf, who was talking more from a physiology point of view, believing that the bone and the soft tissues around the hip responded to their environment. You would see them reflected as dense cortical bone where there was compression and thin cancellous bone and cortical shell wherever there was tension. The contrary school was led by von Mayer, who was more of a mechanical engineer in his approach. He tried to make the hip akin to a cantilevered fair barren crane, where the weight of the body during unilateral stance phase of gait was tilting the body inward or in a varus compression form. Neither school could resolve this controversy. It was left to John Koch in 1917 to write a definitive article which came down on the side of the mechanical engineers. He felt that the gluteus medius was the entity responsible for maintaining equilibrium during that unilateral stance phase of gait. Because of the fulcrum effect of the hip joint, the body worked with twice the leverage of the gluteus medius. Hence, the medius was assigned twice the body weight and effort with each stride. He went on to assign actual numerical values around the medial aspect of the femur. These were positive integers reflecting compression. And on the lateral aspect, he used negative integers reflecting tension. However, as you move distally along the femur, without explanation, he converts the lateral numbers from negative tension to positive compression integers. This was in keeping with the belief at his time that there was compression at both the medial and lateral compartments of the knee. However, he never really explained why he made this transition. He couldn't include the soft tissues and just disregarded their importance or their contribution in his model. Koch's model seemed to be empirically consistent with clinical observations. Fractures in the proximal femur did collapse into varus, seeming to say that there was compression on the medial side. As a consequence of this, we would design hip prostheses to load the medial side of the femur, taking advantage of the medial cortex. We would even have a collar which would engage the medial cortex, putting compression further on the medial side. There were, however, paradoxes that went along with Koch's model. One of the basic ones was that if the gluteus medius was truly responsible to balance the body's weight and exert twice the weight of the body in a tension load at the proximal femur, it would create such a magnitude of load in the proximal femur that you should spontaneously fracture your femur with each stride. When we go further in terms of the dynamic model, we start to look at this expanded picture of soft tissues surrounding the bony structures. We start to examine the importance of these soft tissues in such situations as amputees. There's a dramatic difference between the functioning of an above and a below knee amputee that cannot be easily explained with Koch's model. Both the above and the below knee amputee both have intact gluteus medius muscles. Therefore, they both should be stable when they're walking. However, the above knee is totally unstable, always having Trendelenburg and a limp, and a tremendous decrease in his metabolic efficiencies. If Koch is right, the gluteus medius should be most active at the mid-stance phase of gait when its greatest demand is, is on it. But we find that that's not the case. EMG shows that the gluteus medius is most active before and after mid-stance and is actually in a relaxation mode at mid-stance. These studies have been well codified by Inman, Basmajan, and other observers. They don't explain either why the gluteus medius, if it's performing so much work, is not larger than it is. Another paradox we saw was in the growth and development of the femur. When you're born, your femur is very similar to that of a quadruped. It's almost a vertical 160, 165 degree neck shaft angle. 
As you begin to assume bipedal stance, it's believed that the weight of the body bears down on this plastic young bone, forcing it into its natural 130 degree angle. But this is reached by the time you're only four years of age, not explaining any further increase in varus with increasing weight and increasing levels of activity during the next 10 years of plasticity and growth. We found another interesting difficulty in explaining why those children that have neuromuscular diseases have very high neck shaft angles. And to try and gain containment, we might do an osteotomy to bring the head down into the acetabulum. But in spite of bringing this varus alignment into play through our surgical technique, the body will grow back up into valgus even though the child is still walking. Further paradoxes state that if there is truly compression on the medial side and tension on the lateral side, this was in direct conflict with Wolf's beliefs that the bone reflected its loading environment because there's a significant amount of cortical bone on the lateral side of the femur. Further, when we look at fractures a little bit more closely, we run into a very obvious paradox that in proximal femoral fractures, we very often use compression devices, but we put them on the lateral or tension side of the femur. Based on these conflicts and these paradoxes, we felt it was appropriate to examine our models and to see where was it that they were deficient or lacking. The dynamic model grows out of a, a process of expanding Koch's static model, where he was working just with skeletons and cadavers. If you think of a, an x-ray where you see simply just a skeleton, and then you think of an MRI with all the soft tissues surrounding that bone, you suddenly become sensitive to the importance of all these soft tissues that represent the dynamic forces going on as you walk, stand, or perform daily activities. This drove us to create a more expanded model of Koch's simplistic one. When we first began to study Koch's model and understand where it may be deficient, we went to cadavers and we took hemipelvises and we studied in different combinations of permutations the importance of various soft tissues to the stability of the hip. It led us to an importance in realization that the lateral hip structures, particularly the IT band, act as a tension band, neutralizing bending loads and tension loads on the lateral femur and actually creating in some points in the gait cycle a compression load. This then gave us an understanding of the importance of the IT band in amputees and made us realize the importance of tenodicing these structures down to the femur to improve the performance of the amputee. As we went further along in these biomechanical studies and the soft tissues gained in their importance in our model, we started to be able to reconcile many of the paradoxes and inadequacies of Koch's model. The soft tissue model then is not a displacement of Koch's ideas, but an extension of it to a more complete reality. 